If the last two years have shown us anything, it's this. COVID-19, deepening inequality, and an accelerating climate emergency are putting our societies, our economies, and our planet under threat. This inequality has disproportionately affected women, communities of color, and minority groups, such as the LGBT plus community. Economies are only truly inclusive when they are fair, collaborative, and sustainable. But recent events prove we still have a very long way to go. Last year, the death of George Floyd led to global calls for police reforms and racial equality. Organizations across all industries have come under pressure from staff and stakeholders to do more to confront racism and embrace diversity. Shrinking the racial wealth gap between black and white households and Hispanic and white households is one way the corporate and financial sector in the U.S. can confront racism and add two to three trillion dollars of incremental annual GDP to the economy. In the UK, among FTSE 100 companies, white males make up 84% of executive directorships. Experts say getting people of color into top jobs is the most effective way to close the wealth gap and diversify boards. Additionally, studies show that diversifying the boardroom via gender and sexual orientation advances a firm's strategic goals and increases a company's commitment to equity and fairness. Around the world, there is still a persistent lack of women in leadership roles, making up just 29% of senior management. By unlocking women's economic potential in the workforce over the coming years, it could add an estimated $2.1 trillion to the U.S. GDP by 2025. And it's a similar scenario when it comes to LGBT plus inclusion. Open for Business data shows that companies which are LGBT plus inclusive have a better share price performance, higher return on equity, higher market valuations, and stronger cash flows. The numbers are clear. Societies are stronger when they are open, inclusive, and diverse. So, will we harness this moment in time to transform the world around us for the better? Hello and welcome to the final session of the day. And it's gonna be a great discussion here with some fantastic panelists. So thank you very much for staying with us. My name is Hugo Greenhouch. I'm the LGBT editor here at the Thomson Reuters Foundation and editor of Openly, which is our LGBT plus news website. Uh, but before this, before joining the foundation, I spent 11 years at the Financial Times in a variety of different roles, but most pertinently for this panel discussion, I was wealth correspondent for a couple of years, an editor of the Wealth FT Wealth magazine for nine years. So I spent my time writing and interviewing the 0.001%. I used to joke about breakfasting with billionaires, but that was part of the job. So that gave me a very lofty perspective of the economy from a very, very narrow, extremely top-down lens. So what's going to be fascinating for me in this discussion is to look more bottom up, to examine the issues of those who are locked out or excluded from the wider economy and what business can do to change this. So for me, this taps into the wider discussion of the morality of money. We're not going to get into debate about capitalism. Let's leave that for another time. But we are going to look at the role of business and whether it can or indeed should act as a proxy for government at times in terms of both shifting public opinion and ensuring the economy is as inclusive as possible. So just quickly, what is an inclusive economy? I went to look at the Rockefeller Foundation's definition and they say one in which there is expanded opportunity for more broadly shared prosperity, especially for those facing the greatest barriers to advancing their well-being. So rather than trickle down economics, remember that, it's about making economies more equitable from the bottom up. So what does that mean in practice? How can we convince companies that inclusion is not just good for society, but also for the bottom line? And back to the central theme of today's discussion, what is the business case for inclusive economies? So without further ado, let me just quickly introduce you to this afternoon's panel, and then we'll bash on with the discussion. Cheryl Ed Al Dorsey is the president of Echoing Green, which is a global nonprofit that supports emerging social entrepreneurs. A uh, social entrepreneur herself, Cheryl received an Echoing Green fellowship in 1992 to launch the Family Van, a community based mobile health unit in Boston. And moving on to Henriette Cole, uh, she leads the Gender and Economic Inclusion Group 
at the International Finance Corporation, which is a member of the World Bank Group. She serves as an advocate for gender equality issues in the private sector and works with IFC's clients to include both women and men as entrepreneurs, employees, consumers, community stakeholders, and leaders. Uh, John Miller is a partner at Brunswick Group, working to help companies demonstrate financial value alongside societal value. He is also the founder of Open for Business, which you heard about in the opening video, a coalition of 30 global companies promoting LGBT plus equality. And then Jorge Rubio is the global head of City Social Finance based in London. Uh, City Social Finance works across city businesses globally to develop scalable business platforms and client solutions that enable the bank, its clients and partners to expand financial inclusion. So thank you very much all for joining us. I'm going to start off with a very broad question to get us going. Um, and Henriette, if I can start with you, what do you think the business case for inclusive, inclusive economies is? How do you see it? Thanks so much, Hugo. And first of all, to all who are watching, I hope you're safe and well and have your loved ones around. It has been a roller coaster of a ride. And so this topic comes in very timely because we've seen COVID-19 certainly exacerbate uh, inequities all around the world. But looking at the business case, the encouraging part is that more and more stakeholders have come into play to measure and demonstrate it. So it ranged from McKinsey to the fund, to the monetary fund, to the World Bank, really on the macro level, showing to governments what it is that they might possibly be losing out by not fully including women into the paid labor force. So just to throw one statistic out, if women and men were earning the same for equal work, we would be at an additional 172 trillion in GDP. Now that's marvelous, but that doesn't necessarily convince alone our constituencies, which are private sector companies in emerging markets to perhaps shift gears. And so what IFC has been doing the International Finance Corporation is really to measure the business case at the sector and at the firm level. And just to again, make that very concrete couple of numbers, one, the insurance industry overall could make 1.7 additional trillion from women alone if they were to properly insure women and understand what women consumers want and need, but also if they were to include women in their distribution channels. And on private equity, just to give you one more, we have seen really interesting statistics that we have found in our research moving towards gender balance and private equity, where we found that if you have at least 30% of each gender in the investment decision-making committee, you actually have 10 to 20% higher returns in correlation. That's not causation, but correlation. So we have keeps and binders full of this business case, right? And it's shifted some mindset and it's shifted some, you know, kind of companies and markets to think differently. But I would argue, and that's probably the last point I wanna make is that the business case alone is not sufficient. So we need a couple of additional points to really help us to be much more inclusive. One is in the movie or the film has kind of shown it, um, we need shareholder and consumer and staff commitments and pressure on this. We need legal parity. The Women, Business and the Law report that's just put out 2021 data says only 10 countries in the world have full legal parity when it comes to economic participation of women. So ways to go there from a legal standpoint. And then thirdly, we need standard setting and disclosure. And the UK has done some of that in terms of pay transparency. And I'm hoping that we get other governments to follow through to really ask companies to disclose more data. So the glass is half full. There's a lot more work to be done. And I'm looking forward to hearing from my colleagues here on the panel as to what they've all been up to in that respect. Back to you, Hugo. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so Jorge, if I can come to you next, there's quite a lot there to unpick. Glass is half full, it's glass half empty maybe. Also, as Henry was talking about shareholders, consumers, a collaborative effort, but just to ask that general question, what do you think the business case for inclusive economies actually is? Thank you, Hugh. And first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here and to share uh, this panel with, with, with our partners here. Um, you know, we, it, it's interesting that you ask that question because social finance for city has been an evolution. Uh, so this, this is something that we started 15 years ago when we were created the city microfinance originally. And that was because we were seeing a number of uh, clients, financial institutions mostly, that were developing methodologies to reach underserved segments of the population. So they were scaling up quite quickly they came all mostly from the from the social sector uh, and they were funded 
basically by hard currencies from Europe or the US. So we saw an opportunity to add value there because you know, we, we realized that we needed to connect these players to the markets. We needed to give them access to, to funding in local currencies so that they can expand their, their outreach. So uh, City being present in all these markets, in, in all these emerging markets, you know, it just made sense for us to use these local capabilities to, uh, to help them expand uh, and, and reach even rural areas in the countries where we operate. So that's how we started. But then we saw that many other very interesting social enterprises and corporate clients were looking at the same segment that was being served by, by uh, these financial institutions, microfinance institutions that, by the way, as we all know, around 80% of the borrowers of these institutions are women in emerging markets. So we saw all these companies that were developing interesting models. And now with the use of technology are scaling up quickly as well. So, so for us, it just makes sense to, to work with these clients and provide them with our product expertise, our product capabilities, our local balance sheet, access to markets and investors to help them expand. So it's kind of an obvious business case uh, for us, uh, Hugo, because we have this global network uh, and, and we just realized quite early, 15 years ago from microfinance, that we could use this, this, this expertise to help these intermediaries serve the unserved in, 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 uh, in, in these communities. Oh, yeah, thank you for that. And I think there's a, there's a kind of almost like a tone and tenor of the, of the classic entrepreneur notion of scale. We love the idea of microfinance. How can we make it bigger? How can we make it work for others, et cetera? So now I want to come back to you a bit later as well and ask you more about social finance, just what it is, what it does, what it achieves, how it works. I think the audience would find fascinating. But Cheryl, if I can move on to you at this point. And I, one thing I did mention in, the, in your introduction is that you've had served in two presidential administrations as well. So I think I definitely want to tap into that level of expertise with this starter question of, again, what do you think the business case for inclusive economies is? How do you see it working? Um, thank you, Hugo. Thank you for moderating this session. I'm really honored to be here with Henriette and John and Jorge and, and the assembled audience. Um, I always do like to start um, my remarks in settings like these by recognizing and acknowledging the indigenous people of the land where I now sit. Um, and where I am in the world is the land of the Nacolch tank, which is a name derived from the word Anakwatashinik, which means the town of traders. So it's a good decolonial and social justice practice that I, on well, my own journey, am trying to um, foster and practice. And as we're talking about inclusion and inclusive economies, I think it's a, a good reminder for all of us um, of, of how we come together and stay together in an increasingly multicultural and global world. Um, so from my perspective, um, sitting in the world of social innovation, I actually come to this um, work through a very intersectional lens. So let me sort of talk at the macro level and then make it specific. You know, there is, um, as we know, lots of research out there that connects entrepreneurship growth rates with the economic growth of entire communities, right? So sort of that rising tide that lifts all boats. But then when you make it real, so I obviously am an African-American woman, and in the United States, where I'm coming to you from, um, Black women are the fastest growing group of female entrepreneurs in the United States, right? So you could make the case that not investing in us um, has enormous downsides, but you know, what if I told you, um, you know, that last year in 2020, there were only 93 black women who had secured more than a million dollars in investor backing for their businesses. Or when you think about um, black women led startups, they received only 0.34% Hugo of the total tech venture funding in 2021. That really illustrates um, the capital gaps and the inclusion gaps that we've got to confront if we are gonna truly move toward this idea of an inclusive economies. I wanna plus one what Henriette said about um, contextualizing this in the global pandemic that we've all lived through. You know, the only way truly back from this moment is by doubling down on this idea of an inclusive economy. Again, here in the United States, um, there are over 550,000 black women who have still not returned to the workforce. And when you look at our unemployment rate, it is higher now 
um, than white women um, who um, their unemployment rate is lower than black women's was before the start of the pandemic. So this really does have real world implications and reminds us this is not just sort of a business case, uh, but also a moral case. So how do we think through this together? Um, spot on, I gave back to like an initial point about the morality of money. I think you're absolutely right. There's a strong moral case to change here. But also, I think, you know, just to throw this out to the audience, if we have any private equity people or venture capitalists, this is surely a growth opportunity, an investment opportunity. You're right. If there, there is this capital gap between the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs who are not getting access to funds or financing, it, it, there's a business case here. Certainly, it's an inclusive case as well. But there's absolutely a very strong business ones. I think we're going to look more about the combination of those two factors as we go on. And John, if I can come to you, uh, one thing that Cheryl mentioned as well was intersectionality, which obviously uh, within the LGBT plus community, it's something that uh, we look at quite frequently, how we can work with other areas, other activists, other areas of concern, basically. But just to come back initially to that first question about what do you think the business case for inclusive economies is? How do you see it working? Um, and yes, hi, everybody. It's great great to be with you all. And absolutely, Hugo, that the LGBT plus community is in itself a sort of kaleidoscope of intersectionality. So it's definitely really core to the way um, that we think about the world. Um, I mean, for us in uh, Open for Business, as you mentioned, I mean, we're a coalition of 39 now uh, um, companies, all big global companies covering a range of sectors, so from the sort of Googles and LinkedIn's of this world to Unilever, Lego, Ikea, McKinsey, um, Thomson Reuters, uh, all promoting the economic case, the business case for LGBT plus rights around the world. So focusing particularly on those countries where LGBT plus rights are really challenged because yeah, as we know, there are millions of people uh, around the world who are suffering real exclusion, um, you know, active discrimination and harassment and violence. So this conversation about the, you know, the case for inclusive economies really matters um, to many people. And the coalition was founded on a very deep seated conviction that open, inclusive, diverse societies are better for business. Uh, better for economic uh, prosperity. And so core to our mission as an organisation is uh, what we call data-driven advocacy. So presenting, you know, what's the hard evidence for this? What is the business case? What is the economic case? And you saw uh, a couple of the data points um, in, in the film. We have many more, which I'm sure maybe we'll scatter through the conversation. But what I really want to underline just to open is, you know, we've seen how um, the conversation about the economic case, the, the business case, is such a powerful way to, to reframe the debate in, in countries where there's a hostility towards LGBT plus communities. If we can show that, that discrimination has a tangible economic cost, um, it changes the conversation. You know, it stops being basically a sort of clash of moral systems and starts to become a conversation about what kind of society do we need to be if you know we want to be a modern, competitive, globally globally connected economy, raise levels of entrepreneurialism, of, of innovation, you know, grow more high value uh, industry sectors, um, and all the evidence shows you need to be an inclusive economy where ideas can flow freely, where people of different backgrounds are all able to make their best economic contributions. And there's plenty of evidence to, to prove this. And, and this is really the work of the, the coalition you know, on the ground in, in East Africa, in Eastern Europe, in the Caribbean, uh, in, in ASEAN, all based on the data, all based on the, uh, the economic case for inclusion. And I can already see, um, you know, going at the end of, the, of these opening remarks, what, uh, uh, how many different perspectives there are here on the case for inclusive economy. So I think this is, I'm looking forward to this conversation. John, thank you very much. And I think the, the key thing there for me was reframing the debate, basically looking at it uh, with uh, fresh eyes and really trying to kind of um, not just analyze the issues, but also achieve change. So just to kind of forewarn the panelists, I'm going to, again, go through the issues, work out what the challenges are, but I'm also going to come back to you for a final question when we near the end of our, our, our panel session and ask for something more concrete, a solution, a chance, an initiative, something we can really do to push things forward. But Cheryl, if I can come back to you again, looking at that thing, you the point you raised about the capital gap and also tying in the role of social entrepreneurs. I mean, how can social entrepreneurs ensure they help the community 
but also address the needs of the company's bottom line. How do you square those two? Yeah, I think that's an important question. You know, obviously, as someone who sits in the center of a social entrepreneurship community that really only optimizes around social return on investment, um, we are very much focused on this idea that, you know, GDP is necessary, but not sufficient um, to make a better world. You can be a failing society with robust GDP. You've got to think about social progress alongside um, economic growth. And, you know, I do think sort of social entrepreneurship, which is a fairly new concept and field, has started to, you know, it's all about an alliance-based approach to change. You know, how do businesses, the market, and civil society come together in a way that creates new and shared public value? Um, and it's gaining traction. You know, I, in preparation for this panel, I was looking at some World Economic Forum um, data, which estimates that, you know, businesses partnering with and supporting social entrepreneurs could have a positive impact on the lives of a billion plus people around the world. I mean, now that's scale. That's an, that's an alliance that, that works. And that happens in a couple of ways. You know, social entrepreneurs um, and the work that we do is very good at getting affordable social impact products and services to customers across the value chain of the business. So that's one way. Um, I think the second way is um, that social entrepreneurs are very good at developing value added services um, that better support the operations of businesses. Sort of think about sort of in this um, in this world of um, sort of sustainability and concerns around climate change, um, working with social entrepreneurs to contribute to the circular economy, for example. And then I think last but not least, because of the proximity of social entrepreneurs um, who have engendered real trust and deep social capital within the communities that they serve, they really do provide critical customer insights that are based on this proximity and trust that really do fill key knowledge gaps um, about the marketplace that businesses can use to better serve their communities. So I think those are a couple of ways that this alliance-based model can work. And the key thing there as well is the access to finance. Basically, you, know, you can take an idea, you can have a fantastic, brilliant vision for a company, but if you don't have access to, to, to capital, then it's not gonna happen at all. I mean, Jorge, if I can bring you in at this point to discuss a slight tangent, but looking at social finance, just perhaps if you just explain a little bit about what it is, how it works, and really how it kind of fits into the overall discussion here. Yes, and thank you. And um, we use the word scale in my first participation, and, and Cheryl used the word scale too as well, which is, you know, at the core of the of the of the opportunity. If you if you think about it, uh, when the World Bank um, um, reported the uh, numbers on financial inclusion globally in 2010, there were 2.5 billion people at that point that didn't have a access to financial services that didn't own a bank account. By 2016, that number went down to 1.7 billion. So you might say, well, that's great progress. 800 million people joined the financial system. But, but if you think about it, there are still 1.7 billion people that don't own a bank account. That, that's, a, that's a massive challenge. Uh, 760 million people do not have access to electricity. 250 million children do not go to school. Uh, access to quality medicine, affordable housing, and other basic necessities is limited for, for billions. Smallholder farmers in rural Africa, for example, still struggle to, to, uh, to get access to finance and connect to markets. So the challenges are huge, but the, 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 and, and the scale is enormous. So, so there's no single organization and no um, you know, a single player, whether it's a government or a bank that can, that can you know, fill these gaps on, you know, alone. This is all about partnerships. So social, social finance at Citi is really about building partnerships with our clients, uh, our, whether they might be financial institutions, public sector clients, uh, investors uh, around the world to develop uh, local solutions. Uh, again, I mentioned before the ability to have, to develop local solutions and you know, local capabilities that we have to put those to use and, and develop solutions that reach these underserved communities. So, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's interesting that uh, in, in, the, in the countries where we operate, uh, which are around 95, 50, 52 of them are considered emerging markets and 22 or 23 are categorized by the, by the World Bank as lower income or middle low income. So I think there is 
we, you know, in our leadership, we all understood that we had, we were uniquely positioned to contribute in this in these markets uh, where, where we operate. So, um, as I said before, we started doing financial inclusion heavily, and then we have evolved. Um, and more recently, just last month, we published our social finance framework uh, and issued actually our inaugural social finance bond, which was a one billion dollar bond, where the use of proceeds is to finance a range of social projects including those that expand access to financial services, but also affordable housing, basic infrastructure, healthcare, education, um, and uh, financing of smallholder farmers, uh, which is something you know, that, we, that we like to do, particularly when we can connect them to our corporate clients that are the off-takers of those products, right? So, um, uh, so as you can see, the, the, the role of social finance within the bank has evolved. And uh, it's now about expanding access to basic services to those same communities. It's also about job creation and, uh, and, uh, and infrastructure, social infrastructure development. So we get involved uh, in, in all of those projects you know, across geographies and across businesses uh, you know, in, in the bank. And we have obviously a very intentional uh, focus on women. Uh, the gender angle is very much present across all the categories of our social finance framework. Obviously, in financial inclusion, it's 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 a bit heavier because of the history of microfinance and and how that the, you know the activity is linked to successful uh, women entrepreneurs. Uh, but also in affordable housing and other categories, there is always a, a gender lens that we use when we assess the, the projects, whether it is in India or Latam. Well, that's a very neat segue, Jorge. Thank you very much for giving me that wonderful segue um, to look at uh, the gender lens, look at what that means, particularly from an investment perspective. We've seen quite a few kind of fund managers, asset managers at the moment, looking to invest according to a gender lens. So, so Henriette, could you just explain what it, what it is, how it works, what sort of trends we should be watching out for at the moment? Yeah, and indeed, um, Jorge, fantastic queue up. I mean, one thing that you already just mentioned, which we're seeing as a key trend, which we're very much encouraging, is to go beyond the framing around just banking women entrepreneurs. That is absolutely vital. And there still is a 1.5 trillion SME credit gap, which likely has widened. We don't have global data yet after COVID. But when we look at country-specific data, we've seen women entrepreneurs on average, having 40% of losses of sales compared to in emerging markets, compared to their male-run enterprises, male-led uh, enterprises, which are about only 28%. And if you go further to Cheryl's point into dissecting this by minorities, that figure gets you know, incrementally even smaller. So that is an important part and the access to finance part is, is key. However, beyond access to finance, we know that there's so much more that needs to be done. One, at the corporate leadership level, right? We're still at marginal numbers when you look at the CEOs around the world being women. Second one is in the workforce. Indeed, on average, 30%, depending on the sector and the country, are women in management. But then if you go in male-dominated sectors, that's dwindling down to, you know, between the teens sometimes. So there's a lot more to be done there. The third dimension that I think is really critical is the consumer side. Oftentimes, we don't ask and we don't design for women's wants and needs. And so that has to happen indeed around credit, but also as Hoka said, on housing, on insurance, on all financial products and plus plus, right? But we don't use human-centered design enough to really understand what is it that the end customer actually wants. And we've seen that quite blatantly in COVID where a lot of the PPE equipment, right, wasn't quite designed for frontline healthcare workers, which were predominantly women, and so as a result of which they were less equipped to really protect themselves. Um, and then the next and really, really one of the very, very sticky parts in gender lens investing is the supply chain. And looking at just how inequitable uh, access to supply chains are. So just to throw out you know, one number that's sort of a global number that says around on average 2.2% of corporate spend, that's large corporations, goes to women entrepreneurs. But then oftentimes that's lower. And even the World Bank Group, we did this by ourselves. We said, let's look into our spend, which is about 1.8 billion per year, más o menos, right? It depends on a year. And in our own spending patterns, we only were buying 3.4% of volume from women entrepreneurs. Lousy. However, I think the important part is we measured 
we then disclosed. And now we set ourselves a target to double that, right? To at least move forward and, and really chew down on it. And then the last dimension is the community. So those five stakeholder groups are really at the forefront when we think of gender lens investing. Now, just to come back to a couple of other trends, and I think John, I mean, we love open for businesses data because there is so few data points. And I think if we all can really contribute to getting more data, but there's hope we've seen like open for business, you know, more and more people and organizations coming into that space and saying, you know, what gets measured gets done. And we need this kind of data, not just collecting it, but more importantly, analyzing, using, and disclosing it back to the market. Because oftentimes we're great at hamstering all the data, you know, and holding it very tight, but not really making it as of productive use to the wider, to the wider market. The, the, the third trend that we see, so data availability is increasing. The third trend is partnerships in that space. And so we were excited. We've just partnered with City and You and Women and ICMA on actually yesterday, um, we launched a social bond guidance paper on how can investors and issuers and rangers and underwriters really look at gender financing through the myriad of social bonds that have really come into being, I think, quite frankly, as a response to COVID. We have seen huge, huge interest from investors in our treasury to really invest much more with a social lens. And then there's whole ESG investing. I think the longest time the focus was on climate and it needs to still stay there. I'm not advocating to move it away, but the social pillar and the ESG has sort of been treated as an underdog. And we've seen more and more interest in defining what that S is and what it could be. Um, last, but certainly not least, I would like to mention the 2X collaborative in the gender lens investing space that has just been formed, which I think is a wonderful set of stakeholders and actors started off by bilateral development financing institutions, IFC, the Asian Development Bank, EBIB are all joining. And we're very excited because we're seeing there's such a city and many more, more commercially minded players also really um, being part of this journey to commit to deploy all kinds of capital, really from microfinance all the way up to, to, to really invest those with much more eye to who is accessing this capital and to what productive use is being put from a gender dimension. The one, maybe more, one more point I just wanted to add is that yes, women are absolutely critical to fight microfinance and 80% of borrowers, but what I don't want just to walk away with from this conversation is that we bottlenecking women, you know, into, oh, women are micro. No, women are asset holders across the whole ball game and they're custodians of those assets. And I think we need to be making sure that we can really offer Sort of, if you wish, a financial service system that speaks to all asset classes where women are at and, and not just sort of reduce women to just being vulnerable or micro borrowers, because there is a lot of concentration in the informal sector, but there is also openings and really opportunities for women to trans transform their business into small, growing and large sized companies. And John, just to follow up on that, in terms of looking at the business case for including LGBT plus people, there are more practical impacts, aren't there, in terms of if you are uh, a gay man, if you're transgender, if you're bisexual, and you're living in a country which has anti-LGBT plus laws, uh, that's going to prevent you from a, a range, it's going to throw up a range of issues just beyond uh, the kind of, you know, the day-to-day -day living. So how does one actually move things forward on that kind of practical level in terms of overcoming that? And what role does business have to play in this? Well, to, to pick up on some of Henriette's um, uh, you know comments in terms of the the gender lens, because a lot of that has a, 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 a you know quite straightforward read over to the conversation about LGBT plus inclusion, particularly when it comes to questions of access. Henriette, you were talking about you know access to to finance. We also look at things like access to education, access to healthcare, and you know and how. Um, LGBT plus people are often you know, excluded from being able to access you know, fundamental services in, in a normal way, workforce participation. I mean, in, in any sense, let alone at a, at a leadership sense, um, it, products and services available to consumers and do, you know, do, they, do they meet people's needs in, in, in the right way? But I would say, you know, for us, the, the, the kind of angle in on, on, on all of this is to be reframing the conversation as a conversation about you know, uh, uh, the performance of your economy, you know, is, is this working? Because what we're talking about here, and I would say the language around business case, we, we often talk actually about the economic case more broadly, because again, I think it was Henriette saying in, in, at the beginning, this 
this is about business. It's about more than business as well. It's about people. It's about livelihoods. It's about whole economies. And so, you know, we we think of it, in fact, on 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 three levels and our analysis and all the data we collect you know, it's on, it's on three levels. And I'm, I just run through them very quickly because it's so at the core of, you know, of, of, uh, of you know, the conversation I think we can be having about inclusive economies. So first of all, at an individual level, we see lots of links between LGBT plus inclusion and performance of individuals. And, and when I say individuals, I don't just mean the LGBT plus ones. I mean, the performance of all individuals in an inclusive environment where is improved, whether that's about um, productivity or levels of motivation or people feeling more satisfied or they have, you know, in the workplace, they have better health outcomes, like they have less stress, less uh, burnout. Um, they're more likely to speak up you know, with, you know, point out concerns or have new ideas or you know, lots of different dimensions. And, and again, we've got all the data that, that, that can, can you know, demonstrate these connections. Secondly, we have we do have links to performance at a business level, at a company level. And so this is data that shows us that LGBT plus inclusive companies are better at attracting and retaining talent, that um, these companies are more innovative. They have stronger brands. And crucially for the conversation with the chief finance officer, um, there are links to financial performance, to um, you know, stronger share price, uh, greater return on, on equity to, to cost of capital. And then the, the final level for us in, in the work we do it is connections between LGBT plus inclusion in society and economic performance. So inclusive societies have stronger economic growth. They're more competitive. They have higher levels of entrepreneurialism. They have more foreign direct investment. Um, there are even correlations with measures like corruption um, and, and, and transparency. And we have lit literally hundreds of data points across all of these dimensions. I, I could give you a very long, uh, but I promise you very interesting PowerPoint presentation, maybe some other time uh, on all of this, but it's a, it's a really clear picture. You know, no matter what dimensions you're looking at, if you look across the whole waterfront, LGBT plus inclusion goes hand in hand with improved performance at an at a economic level, at a business level, at, a, at an individual level. And, and that storyline, is a, is a different kind of conversation about the rights of LGBT plus people. Well, that's also going to tap into one, one thing I want to move the conversation on to again, which is look at the, the role of business here, the role that companies have to play, particularly larger companies. I was uh, uh, interviewing um, a very well-known entrepreneur who may or may not own an airline, and he was talking about uh, going to a particular African country which had just come out and said some incredibly nasty things about the LGBT plus community. And he'd arranged to have lunch with the president of this particular country and then pulled out. I mean, not just pulled out of the lunch, but also pulled out of the country. And there was this kind of rolling effect of economic impact directly because of anti-LGBT plus laws. This is a, you know, very much a QED situation. But Cheryl, back to the, the, the point about how can larger companies learn from these types of things, from social entrepreneurs, particularly at, um, you know, at, at the ground level? So I think that's an important um, question, and I will apologize um, in advance if this is too meta of an answer. But you know, in uh, I, I am sort of very worried about um, the state of the world these days, especially with sort of this rolling um, global democratic backsliding. And I actually do not think you can separate that from sort of the rise of populist um, energy and impulse that is happening across the globe. And I'm fond of saying, and I think I could, could make the case um, to you all for this, that I uh, am increasingly beginning to see social innovation as the flip side of populism. We all know that sort of our 20th century structures no longer work for the scale and complexity of our challenges but our prescriptions are just different. Sort of the populist impulse is a nihilistic one, right? Just blow it up, consequences be damned. Whereas social entrepreneurs and those in the ecosystem, businesses um, for, for good, civil society, um, wanna fix things, right? So how do we sort of build these 21st century structures um, that will um, demonstrate to the broader population that we can collectively solve our problems together and we don't have to default 
too far too often when populism sort of gets aligned with authoritarian figures um, that you've got to default to a strong man mentality versus collective approaches to solving our, our problems. And I think businesses have got to recognize their role, their leadership role in the 21st century as never before. I was reading some research that looked at like the 100 largest GDPs around the world. Well, more than half of them are businesses, businesses as sovereign actors that increasingly have got to lean in, not just around sort of the work of business, but the work of knitting together um, sort of societal fabric. That's a new responsibility and a new role, but it is absolutely vital um, to do because of sort of the um, the level of sovereignty that more and more businesses have across society, but also the assets that they hold. And I think social entrepreneurs can be good partners in this. You know, it's fun to be here with, with Jorge. We've had a wonderful partnership with City over the years through our inclusive social entrepreneurship initiative. I think it's been wonderful bi-directional learning. Um, we just launched a new partnership with our friends at Goldman Sachs through their One Million Black Women initiative, where we're going to be investing and a number of incredible African-American um, women social entrepreneurs to decrease that capital gap that you talked about, um, Hugo, and that Henriette works on so closely. So these sorts of um, forged alliances, um, I think, is, is indicative of what's to come. But I have to say, I feel like our very sort of democratic fabric is at stake if we don't figure out how to do this. And just to come back to you, the, 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 the fact that you've got a lot of kind of, you know, fantastic kind of Wall Street names kind of getting involved, but is it enough or is it just a drop in the ocean, do you think? Um, well, I sort of think, you know, we have to make the row by walking. So I'm sure it's never enough, but don't we have to start somewhere? And I just sort of building the muscles around working in this new way together. I just don't see what, uh, what other choice we have sort of... Um, given um, you know, given the challenges we've got to confront in the decades to come. Well, Hoya, let's, let's push this to you in that case. In terms of leaning in, in terms of achieving that difference and actually making it happen, how does one go about that? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Sharon, for the comment on the, on, the, on the foundation. I think philanthropy plays a, a hugely important role in, in all of these. I mean, to start with, this team here wouldn't exist without the pioneering work of the City Foundation, for example. I mean, they, they started since the 70s, uh, sowing the seeds uh, of you know, microfinance programs around the world. And today they, they remain very active, obviously, in financial inclusion, but also in things like action for racial equity and the projects that, uh, that we work with, or the foundation works with, uh, with, with Sherry, for example. So, uh, but, it, but when it comes to scaling it up, I think that, uh, that the solutions need to be market-based. They need to originate in the business in order to reach the scales and also to be replicable. Uh, so at least the way we think about it is that we, we need to embed social finance across uh, the businesses and our risk policies, which is the DNA of the bank, right? Incorporating social metrics in our due diligence process, understanding the risks associated uh, to the delivery of uh, products and services to, to you know, communities that have less financial education, for example, uh, responsible and fair lending principles across those need to be very well you know, embedded in everything we do. Uh, understanding the use of proceeds, that the, 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 the design of the products are adequate, that the pricing makes sense, that the products are transparent. By having all, those, all of those things incorporated in your day-to-day, -day, in your risk policies, then you can have a platform to scale. And of course, partnerships. We mentioned partnerships. Many of the things that we do uh, are in partnership with our clients, but also with, let's say, development finance institutions. You know, they, they might uh, want to take, or, or, or their mission enables them to take greater risk that commercials can, commercial banks can. So we, we partner with them to expand capacity and, and to do more. So, so this is, this is uh, Hugo, I think, the way to scale. And uh, it's, it's a start. But, but, you know, this, this enables things like the commitment that our CEO made, you know, mobilizing one trillion in sustainable finance by 2030. I mean, you can only talk about these numbers when you're really putting your products, your, the best of your people and, uh, and, 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 and businesses uh, on the line. Well, Henriette, how does one lean in, in that case, from a gender lens perspective, gender lens investing perspective? First of all, I just want to say, Cheryl, I really... So of your comments were fantastic in terms of just how businesses need to reset and be 
think their role in terms of accountability, responsibility and, and reach. And just to share one you know, particular story that uh, comes to mind with, with that is, we invested our first ever um, gender dedicated loan into the Bank of Palestine in, in the Middle East. And they were bold enough in an incredibly difficult market to say, we're taking those 11 million and we're dedicating them. And we're promised to IFC, this is the money we give to women entrepreneurs. Not just doing that, but then tailoring the offering and combining it with a non-financial advisory arm that included training around community connections, contracts, connectivity around digital connectivity, how to balance care and, and, and paid work or self-employed work. And the CEO himself, Hashem Shava, was still, still, still in office, made it a point at the graduation of those women entrepreneurs in Gaza and the West Bank to invite them to his home and to celebrate their success. And that we've seen countless examples where yes, the business case, and we've proven them the business case, and if we were proven right after the program closed, is super crucial. But there is this human connectiveness that I think some have the capability to build a vision of leadership that really is inclusive from a much more human-centered perspective as opposed to just purely on the numbers. But the numbers have to be there. And so there's no excuse for that. But coming back, um, you know, Hugo, to your question. So we've been at this with the International Finance Corporation for quite some time, and we've figured some things out, but certainly not everything. So let me just share a couple of the things that we felt we've gotten more or less, you know, into a direction that we're proud of and then where some of the gaps are. One is I think you can only be credible to your market if you're walking the top indoors. So I gave you the procurement example, right? But even from a workforce the dimension, we did the economic dividend for gender um, equality certification, it's EDGE in short. For those of you who don't, who don't know it, look it up. It's, it's very interesting as a tool. There's also Edge Plus, which really expands to bring in LGBTI populations and minorities and more. So we got certified and we only got the base level, right? So we weren't at the top, which is gold standard level. But again, the important thing was we were the first DFI in the world to do it, to not be afraid and to say we're going to get certified and we disclose that. And now the exciting part of it is that almost all the other DFIs have followed suit and actually also got certified. So there's a peer pressure market leader opportunity, I think in that space, that's very, very good. Second is we've set ourselves four corporate scorecard targets around gender to a volume base in terms of our actual capital getting into the hands of women. One had to do with equity nominations on board where we wanted to get to 50% um, of our own nominations being women. And that's one target we've exceeded. We are currently at 57%, which is fantastic. But we all know once we've succeeded targets, we often take our foot off the pedal and kind of let go. But the important thing is to keep at it, right? And to make sure this continues. And then the third one was to really mark all the projects that have a gender focus as such, so we can track over time, are we actually increasing them or are we re reducing them? And then couple that with a very strong World Bank group wide gender strategy, which holds us accountable over a period of six years. Um, so then one couple of learnings and then gaps where we need to learn more. So one thing that we've learned is capital alone is great, but certainly not sufficient because the credit line into institution comes and goes. Once 30 or 400 million are dispersed, oftentimes we see business perhaps, you know, return to the norm and the majority. Um, and so we need to have very carefully co-created technical support to our clients that we're giving in emerging markets and really work together on a journey that looks at a whole dimension of non-financial services that go hand in hand with the investment. The next that we've learned is that obviously partnerships are absolutely critical. As I was saying, if you look at the gaps that are in front of us, it could be daunting and you could walk the other way, but it's important to say, no, we can do this and we don't need an extra 157 years as the, I think the World Economic Forum predicts in closing these gender gaps and we can do it together. So partnerships were helping us enormously with Goldman Sachs, we have the Women Opportunity Facility, with the Women Entrepreneurship Finance Initiative. We had 12 governments pull together and really invest in that space. So we want to see more of those partnerships. And then the third dimension is we've really learned that data collection systematically at our portfolio level of clients is critical. And asking of our clients, even if they're doing relatively well upon entry of investment, to find a stretch target. What is it that they can do differently in the period of you know, seven years of investment. 
Last but not least, um, we've learned that even the sticky topics can be investment conversations. And what I mean by that is we've worked on childcare since 2017. And frankly, when we first started, lots of colleagues were asking, Henrietta, we are an investment bank. What are you talking about childcare? Why is that relevant for us? And we could prove a very strong business case for employers who provide that type of childcare. Could be on-site, off-site, after school, whatever the right format is but very, very strong returns um, on that initial investment. And now it's top of everybody's mind. How can we support employers? Because we know there's huge fiscal constraints at the government level in many of the countries working. So if we just rely on governments in fixing our care issues, we are not going to get there. This has to be a multi-stakeholder effort. And so care has been at the core of our thought process and, and conversations with clients. And the second one is gender-based violence. And even on that topic, again, we have 15 reports measuring the business case of what employers can gain when they tackle the issue at the workplace and including domestic violence, so productivity gains and so on and so forth. But the important thing is that stakeholders, I would say a few years ago, were walking the other way when you started with that conversation. And now the conversation is much more clearer, not just on gender-based violence, but how do we create safe workplaces, because this polarization that Cheryl mentioned is seeping into the workplace, right? And it's con constantly, it's like pollution that's not very visible, but it's there. And so I think safe workplaces are top of people's minds. And if we can build that into any of our technical advice that we can give to clients, that is very much, I think, where we need to be as an investor. Yeah, fantastic. And I think you're right to say there are a lot of companies which are talking the talk, but I want to ask and perhaps turn the conversation around to ask whether they're actually walking the walk, as it were, and particularly those companies which um, are, from an LGBT perspective, perhaps, um, you know, fly the freedom flag uh, during Pride Month and yet are still doing masses of business in Saudi Arabia and Russia. I mean, John, are businesses doing enough? I mean, is there an element of hypocrisy here? Um, are, are, are businesses doing enough? No would be a short, short answer. Just before I come to that, I do also, Henriette, Henriette picked up, Cheryl, your comments a couple of times on the, the polarisation and the, uh, and the, and the sort of pop, pop, populism uh, 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 you know, under, underneath a lot of this in, in, in many countries. And I do think it's worth just, just touching on that again, because you know, for us, even just in the last couple of years in the work that, that we're doing and working with activists in, in many countries where it's really contentious issue, we're, we're seeing this is becoming like a, a sort of geopolitical wedge issue where you have, you know, a whole, whole set of populist, anti-democratic, possibly pro-Putin in some countries, sort of politicians who are, who are using, you know, LGBT plus hate as a kind of rallying cry. Um, actually, and and that's really difficult. You know, that's it's dangerous, and you know, from a from a business point of view, it, it, the, the companies who, even with the the best intentions and the you know, fully wanting to go into this uh, and be present in countries like that, it makes it very very difficult. And so that's that's definitely something that's turning the heat up on this entire conversation, and and uh, not not to underestimate. And that's very live at the moment. You know, we're seeing this changing um in in lots of different countries um but are, are businesses doing enough i mean I, I, well let's, let's be blunt are, are they being hypocritical can again flying the freedom flag in safe countries but actually still doing business in in countries which have massive anti-lgbt plus laws well i think the question there is um if you're doing business in a country that has an uh, anti-lgbt plus laws how are you using your influence as a business to create change um you know uh, and by all means, we should we should be challenging to businesses that are operating in those countries about about that. But often, pulling out of the countries isn't isn't the answer. It doesn't necessarily, um, you know, s serve the interests of the LGBT plus communities. It's usually not what the LGBT plus communities in those countries are actually asking for. It's a slightly different question if you're a global company thinking about investing in a in a country. Then you can be saying, you know, we would love to be investing, building a new factory, opening a new, opening a new data center in your country. But we're, we have some concerns about some of the laws you have in relation to LGBT plus people. But we we have seen, though, you know, I would say, I mean, the, we, the business community is not doing enough. It is frustrating. Um, but we are seeing examples of what it looks like 
when when businesses you know do flex their muscles you know i mean earlier this year open for business published a big study across eastern europe the the economic cost of discrimination and then uh, actually only a few weeks later hungary passed i'm sure you've all, all, all seen it a particularly uh, odious law banning lgbt plus content on the pretext of pretending uh, for prote- protecting um families and we we were able to very quickly turn around uh, a business statement in response to this which we we published on the morning before the law was put before parliament and it was very widely covered in the in the media in hungary um you know it, on uh, on hungarian tv activists talking about the, the business implications and the business the economic you know uh, uh, implications of of laws like this um and you know the government in hungary felt um it necessary to issue a response so they clocked it okay but it didn't change the law but it did send a, a very clear signal that um you know businesses won't stand silently by whilst these kinds of laws um are passed and this is the kind of action that businesses can take you know acting together and we we need to see much more of this in Poland right now, in in Ghana right now, in Uganda, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in many countries, millions of people are facing daily discrimination, state-sponsored discrimination, social stigma because of their um, sexual orientation uh, or or gender identity. Uh, Are we doing enough? No, but I do think we have a very clear model for how businesses can become advocates globally when they are in those countries. And and local businesses too, not just talking about global businesses um, either, um, for how they can become advocates for inclusion. I think we have that, but it would be great to see it accelerating and scaling. Charles, I saw you nodding away there um, as John was speaking. Um, Do you think that big business is doing enough? And to what extent can social entrepreneurs show them, inform them uh, ways to do it better? No, I agree with John, not not doing enough yet, but we we keep um, pushing forward. You know, there was a interesting and I think sort of data and tracking and transparency and accountability all make a difference here. There was a interesting um, Washington Post article a couple months ago that looked at sort of all of the philanthropic commitments that were made after the murder of Mr. Floyd in May of 2020. Um, And, you know, the reporters actually did a good job of sort of demonstrating that, um, you know, the total was large, about $50 billion. But when you got underneath that, most of it went to business aligned activities, loans and traditional investment work versus a very small amount that was dedicated to um, the criminal justice types of reforms that led millions of us to the streets um, last uh, spring and summer. Um, So this kind of work continues, but um, you know, doing the work that John does, doing the work that so many social innovators do, is just um, incredibly important. And um, it's, I think, part of the broader um, work that has to be done in sort of shifting power. Um, and it's not easy. It's very bumpy, but um, it is it is the work we all have to do. So. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm just going to come in now with a, a question from the audience. So thank you very much for sending this one in. It's, it's kind of a spin on what we've just been talking about, but also looking more about how you embed these notions uh, over the long term. How can businesses ensure their approach towards inclusion, inclusion rather, has a significant long term impact and moves away from short term solutions that can come across as tokenism? Uh, Jorge, should we come to you? How does one differentiate that to make sure it's a long term solution rather than short term tokenism? Well, that's a, a very interesting question, and, and uh, well, as we mentioned before, uh, the work that we do builds on a 15-year track record uh, you know, in, in, in financial inclusion and inclusive finance in general. So we've been through crisis. We've seen things in India, in Andhra Pradesh, in Central America, um, and other places. And <clears throat> what has happened, actually, is that our social finance clients have always come back strong. I mean, and they're still scaling. <laughs> So, uh, you know, we haven't experienced any losses in our portfolio, <clears throat> excuse me. So our clients, you know, are, are continuing to thrive. And now- it, so, so even, sorry to interrupt, but so even during a downturn, kind of back to those kind of um, dangerous days of 2007, 2008, 
when the global economy kind of fell off a cliff. I mean, there was always a danger that issues of inclusion, diversity were kind of bull market luxuries. But that did that happen in terms of people kind of cutting back on these type of issues because thinking purely bottom line stuff and everything else can go out the window? Yes, there, 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 there will always be bumps uh, uh, in the road. Uh, obviously, now the pandemic, the crisis that you mentioned, we, we came up uh, uh, with a solution with our uh, friends from 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 the from OPEC at that time, the DFC uh, and uh, you know Blue Orchard and others to to create a a fund to provide liquidity to some of these things. Because it was a liquidity crisis, uh, and we did. And and uh, you know it's great to see that most of these you know uh, clients have have you know past that moment of crisis uh, and are scaling uh, scaling again. So uh, I think when you're doing the, you know, sort of the right thing and, it, 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 you know, you're, you are addressing the needs of a, of a segment of a population, uh, you know, this can, this, can, this can scale. And, you know, even, even when the bumps that we described. Um, so our, our clients, what they have in common is that this, you know, the ability to reach this scale. I remember this example in Mexico of a, of a client that we started working with them. Actually, one of the first transactions that we did for them was in partnership with the IFC. It was the first time that we took this company to the market with a partial guarantee from the IFC and investment grade, local investment grade bond. Um, you know, they were serving at that, uh, at that moment, 300,000 women in the south of the country. Now they serve close to 3.5 million in, in, in two countries. So. So you can see that, and and now, I think we are we are living through a very similar moment in terms of, you know, social entrepreneurship and technology. A, um, you know, these these enterprises and inclusive businesses serving the last mile are emerging and are now, you know, coming up with innovative ways, uh, whether it is off grid electricity, healthcare, um, water and sanitation. You know, boosted by te by technology and 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 uh, internet access, smartphone penetration. So so that's that's very encouraging. So just to 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 finalize my comments on this is you know we, we partner with with the Ford Foundation and DFC to create a program that would help us finance in local currencies these social enterprises at an early stage, <clears throat> which is that's when they need access to capital and they're still. You know, probably pre-profit, but they have great models and they don't have access to commercial borrowing. So this this program was designed to help them access funding uh, early on. Uh, and you know, we have now a few examples of companies that we that we have providing funding to through this program. That now <clears throat> there's a company called Delight, for example, in in sub-Saharan Africa that that you know specializes in 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 providing off of real electricity solutions to to households. And now they, they have been able to, to diversify their sources of funding. They have become an important client of the bank. So I think the message here is that when you, are, when you build solutions for, for these entrepreneurs early on, when they need it, it you can basically see how, how they can you know, expand, expand access by, by getting the right sources of capital in place. And I want to come back to a couple of things you raised there, not least, I think, kind of the, the, the shadow uh, or the, the hovering kind of in a notion of COVID and the impact it's had as well. But uh, Henry, if I think you wanted to come in on, on this point. Just to compliment Horace, excellent point. I think today we will really focus our conversation on value creation and the opportunity, right, of including others. And there's the, the other part, I would say, as an investor, you know, we have to go and we are using performance standards before we invest, right, on a due diligence side and the appraisal. And I think there is opportunity to make very sure that before we invest in companies, we work together with them to assess around labor standards, around environmental standards, displacement, benefit sharing, and so on and so forth, to make sure that the whole community is included, right? We've seen projects, of course, in particular, also when we look at gender-based violence. So we've committed to screening all of our investments that we are making for risks around gender-based violence and then to work with clients to mitigate against them. And obviously anything to do with infrastructure where you have greenfield, you have large inflow of labor. We've seen upticks in you know, gender-based violence, sexual trafficking, child trafficking, and so on and so forth. So these are the areas that need to be very, very thoroughly looked at and examined at the point of before deploying your capital 
so that you can create a plan with the company to tackle this issue. So I just want to bring the ESG due diligence dimension into this, because I think it's, it's very important that we are not being let off the hook and our eight performance standards that IFC has created quite some time ago still sort of guide the community. You know, there's tweaks and turns to it, and obviously they, they, they can be enhanced as we move forward, but I think they're still quite vital to make sure that at least there's a consistent approach to inclusion when we go through the due diligence stage and tackle some of the discrimination that might be visible or the ones that are a little bit more subtle. Mm -hmm. And Henriette, are you seeing this embedded not just in company culture, but also in the balance sheet in terms of these ideas, these, these initiatives nowadays? So it, it very much depends, I would say, right? So it really ranges from the answer, absolutely, but not that often <laughs> to, you know, a long way to go. I think what is very important is to bring in levels of innovation as new business models emerge, right? And so I think the digital part is a really important one. And we worked um, a few years back with, with Uber on really trying to understand when ride-sharing models are being introduced in a country, what does it do to economic access, mobility, affordability, who's driving, who's riding, what are the purposes? Going back to my point around design, to better understand whether we like the business models or not, let's put that judgment aside. But they're there, they're growing rapidly, right? We've seen many local Ubers and so on and so forth. So when we start as investors and community of investors investing in online platforms, what do we want to see in order to invest, right? So how can we adjust some of the business models and not commit the same mistakes and crimes that sort of, you know, very traditional industries have made over the decades and centuries and so we can be faulted for, for working with those types of new stakeholders and criticize, and there's been a fair amount of criticism to, to be very sure. But I do strongly believe that as these business models take root and take hold, it's better to understand where the gaps are, what the barriers, what the opportunities are, and then try and get in and influence as these move on. And another example, if viewers are interested in, we just looked at the e-commerce market in Africa and Asia, because obviously we moved online during COVID so much in terms of our purchasing. And we've seen really interesting points that yes, if we were to close the sales gap on e-commerce platform, we would have a business case of 300 billion additional revenues by 2025. But if we just leave the market to be as is and assume it's gender neutral because it's digital and there's less discrimination, we are very, very wrong. And so the same obstacles and social norms to some extent are being replicated and mirrored online that we've seen offline. There's some opportunities obviously to transform faster some of these. Um, occupational segregation is less pronounced online than it seems to be offline. So there's some really positives, but without course correction, it's not gonna resolve our, our, our gender gaps and any other gaps, frankly. Henriette, we're kind of almost on the way there to a kind of a partial solution to things. There's certainly kind of some ideas to chew on. Uh, and I, as I said at the very beginning, I wanted to kind of move from the analysis of the issues, the challenges, to trying to posit some sort of, not a solution, because we're not going to come up with a fantastic solution for everything in, in the remaining 10 minutes or so, but something, uh, one or two points that would just take the conversation forward. Does the onus uh, lie on business to change? Does the onus lie on governments to create a different corporate culture? Uh, Jorge, what do you think? What would change the conversation? What would move things forward, do you think? Well, I think I, I, I briefly mentioned in, in one of my uh, previous participations that, that you need to embed this in your business model. I mean, this cannot be a parallel activity or something you do with a different pocket, a, a different you know, a accountability from, from, from senior leaders. This has to be at the core of the organization and it has to come from the top. And this is what we have experienced recently. I mean, the the... the Jane Fraser has been, as the CEO of City, has been extremely, you know, vocal about the, the, the need to, to build this bank with a soul, as she calls it. Uh, and, and the idea basically is to, to have all these elements embedded in your risk policies and everything you do so that, you know, social finance becomes an activity that we do across, right? So it's not, it's not a specific niche uh, of the bank. I, I would say that's that's the uh, that's a, a way to to move forward, Hugo. Fantastic, thank you, uh, John. Again, I'm just watching the clock quite carefully, so just a couple of minutes with a couple of ideas about again how to take the conversation to move things forward. Uh, very simply, I think if if you know, for companies, 
or for people inside businesses, you know, as this conversation shows, there's a growing global movement that's moving forward the case for inclusive economies. I mean, I'm hugely proud of the work that our co coalition partners on uh, Open for Business do, making that case in countries where it's a risk to make that uh, that case. So join this movement, you know, get in touch, be, be part of it. And for, for anyone that's interested in supporting LGBT inclusion, whether you're inside a business or, or anywhere, I'd say simply get informed. The more you know about what's going on in the world, the more the easier it is to spot opportunities very naturally just to take to take part. So the work that you do, Hugo, with Thomson Reuters Foundation and with Openly is so important. Just understand what it's a lot going on out there and, and a lot changing. So um, just inform yourself, I think, would be a, a really great starting point. Well, thank you. So, uh, Henry, we have em embed, embed the kind of processes within the culture. John, change things, get involved. Uh, Henry, what would you say? I mean, how do we make economies more inclusive? Definitely the data is a core point to that. So if we have national statistic offices collecting data that's very much segregated and detailed into subgroups and not just, you know, bundling everyone in under just two genders, I think that is a starting point, but certainly by all means not, not anywhere sufficient. That would be wonderful. And as I said, collecting the data, analyzing the data, using the data and disclosing it back out is the full journey. And then I would say just because I'm based in Washington DC and, and you know, work in a very privileged institution as a World Bank group, stuff, I feel like tackling racism is something that we in the institutions ta have taken incredibly serious um, over the past year and a half. Um, oftentimes we were assumed, because we are diverse, we are in over 200 countries, right? And we were assumed to be, um, you know, sort of immune against racism, but of course far from it. And so every single organization can conduct their own racism surveys in-house, learn more around how people feel inside the institutions around anti-racism efforts and racial experiences, and really make sure that there's a code of conduct that makes sure that everyone feels welcome, included, and their voices to be heard. We have a long journey to go. Again, I'm proud of the World Bank Group that we've done the survey. We have now just put out a public charter and we've set ourselves ambitious goals. Um, we have a lot of learning to do in that space. And so looking forward to working with others and learning more. And so hoping to connect with Cheryl, perhaps post call, because we haven't had any connection before this. And that's what today's all about. So thank you. Please do connect away, Henry. Thank you very much. And then Cheryl, again, a couple of things to chew over in terms of a long journey, a lot of learning to do. Again, back to that central question, how do we make economies more, more inclusive rather? Yeah, and, and Henriette, I can, cannot wait to connect. And this was a wonderful conversation. I'm so grateful to be here with all of you. It was really robust and rich. And I think I couldn't agree more with what all of my panelists has, have said. You know, Henriette talked about sort of the power of sort of new business models, sort of waves of innovation that sort of crash into established organizations. And there's that sort of back and forth and give and take. And I've sort of watched the Echoing Green community now almost 30 years as sort of these centers of innovation and how they percolate up. And they may be small relative to institutions like um, Jorge's, but they have disproportionate impact on changing the framework of how we think about business models. You know, I was just emailing with one of our um, social entrepreneurs, a wonderful woman of color, Shivani Saroya. She and her co-founder, another woman of color, Bonnie Oliva, started a fintech company called Tala, which works with just-in-time credit scoring to get resources um, to women in emerging markets. And, you know, we invested in them over a decade ago. Go, but their current valuation is now about 800 million. They just raised their Series E about 145 million. And to see these sorts of models sort of begin to penetrate the mainstream, I think, is one of the most powerful um, points to illustrate what what all of my fellow panelists were saying that this wave is coming. It's it's already here. We just need to sort of create the enabling environment to sort of accelerate it. I will say though, to Henriette's point as well. You know, I've sort of watched a, a lot of these innovations as what I talked about in sort of the microfinance space. We're now seeing a lot of this innovation and this sense of urgency around sort of climate change um, as it uh, both mitigation and adaptation. You're seeing a lot of really interesting models. And I do think increasingly around sort of structural racism and how it prevents sort of economic mobility for families of color, sort of some of these conversations that I'm star starting to see around employee and worker ownership, sort of new models that are starting to build up the conversations that are starting to be had. I think this is all 
um, going to continue to play out because as we sort of throw off um, these oppressive forces that don't sort of allow all of us to show up bringing our gifts and our brilliance um, into the into the marketplace we just can't we can't thrive uh, we can't thrive in the 21st century so I think you know when I listened in on some of the sessions at the World Economic Forum uh, earlier this year and they were talking about sort of stakeholder capitalism gives me a little bit of hope that we we are starting to change our mental models and I just think we all have to continue to double and triple down on all of this work uh, but social entrepreneurs, and their new business models and their illustration of new markets that are open um, and available for investment um, are, are good catalysts for continuing to do this work. Well, Cheryl, Jorge, Henriette, John, let's leave you with that fantastic comment uh, about how to bring all our brilliance into the marketplace. So that's a question very much for people watching. Um, and please do let me know, do email us with your comments and your suggestions. But in the meantime, thank you very much again to our panelists.